All right, welcome to chapter three, We're talking about gender, uh, the meaning of masculinity and femini femininity and the family. In the field of sociology, we sometimes refer to masculinity in the plural, masculinities. Uh, there are different expressions. Uh, for some expressions of masculinity, we see uh, four-wheelers and, uh, and hunting. In other places, it may be a specific sport. Uh, with feminine, femininities, uh, it's very similar in some cultures. Uh, femininity is expressed in different ways. So when we look at various meanings of those terms uh, and the relationship they have with the family, and that's what we'll be talking about in, in this chapter. So it's important that we differentiate between sex and gender. When we talk about sex, we're talking about the biological characteristics that determine male versus female. So we're looking at primary sex characteristics. Uh, those would include the male genitals, uh, the female genitals as well. Now when we talk about gender, we look at the socially learned. So in my classes, I oftentimes ask my students to write down this phrase, to be male, I must, parentheses, to be female, I must, uh, blank. All right, so how would you complete those sentences? Uh, and I'm really more interested in, in what life experiences helped you fill in those blanks. When we talk about gender, we see specific roles. So in the, in the field of sociology, we look at the, dif the difference between a status and a role. So a status is a social position, and a role is the expectation that is attributed to that position. So if I am occupying the status of a married man, uh, my role would be what does uh, a married man do? And so in that case, the gender role would be the expectations of what in my culture married men are supposed to do. Now the sex role is the beha behavior defined according to the, the biological constraints. In hunting and gathering societies, men were originally responsible for bringing meat back to the social unit. Uh, women who were nursing, caring for children, were less mobile. We do see some evidence among hunting and gathering societies that uh, women were also engaged uh, to a certain degree in the uh, careers um, afforded them. So if you look at Lewis and Clark, Sacagawea um, accompanied Lewis and Clark on their expeditions out west. She brought along with her her uh, French trapping husband and her newborn child. Uh, and this is a picture of how some hunting and gathering societies allowed flexibility uh, for women. But for the most part, women were going to be nursing and caring for children. So how is your gender socialization? Uh, this is a process by which people learn the characteristics of their group. We learn socialization into gender roles from our family, our school, our peer group, as well as the mass media. Take a quick inventory of what gender messages you might have received from each of these places. So how would this message be completed for you? To be male in my family, I must blank. To be male in my school, I must blank. To my peer group, I must blank. And the media tells me as a man, I should blank. Right. As a female in my family, what should I do? As a female in my school, 
um, how should I act? In my peer group is a female, and in, according to the mass media, I should act in what way? According uh, because I'm a female. So these gender messages are are uh, influential through our formative years, and they do impact our family. As you come into a marriage and a family, your ideas about gender are passed and transmitted on to your kids. So nature speaks to the biological sex that we are given at birth. Uh, the social role that we are born into is a status. So we are given the label girl or boy and roles are socially determined uh, along with a biological label. Uh, but at some point we develop our own gender identity. Your own gender identity is in essence uh, how you express yourself as male, female. So a person's psychological sense uh, of how they choose to live out their maleness or their, uh, or their femaleness, right? Their masculinity or their femininity. From time to time, there are children born with uh, sexual ambiguity, so it may not be evident from the child's genitals whether or not they're male or female. They may have certain sex characteristics of male, female. Uh, historically, these folks were called hermaphrodites. Uh, we use the term intersexed today, whereas a person is born with uh, they are cross-sexed. They're born with both male and female sexual organs um, or external organs that are ambiguous. Uh, in terms of prevalence, um, about 0.01% of the population are intersexed. So this is one in every 2,000 births um, or about 99.99% of most people uh, will not be intersexed. Uh, but that does give you some sense uh, that, that this is a, a real issue. Uh, in the 1950s, it was not uncommon for doctors to perform uh, gender or sexual re sex reassignment uh, where um, any ambiguous genitals would be removed and uh, the child would be assigned the gender of a female, or the sex of a female. And this is sort of backfired if uh, the hormonal sex uh, leads to secondary sex characteristics. Um, and so this has really led the medical community to make a more cautious approach uh, and to avoid any kind of sex reassignment surgery early on. There's some variance in different societies about who uh, is more of a leader in the family. We joke about who wears the pants. Uh, but in matriarchal societies, uh, females dominate family life. Uh, patriarchal societies uh, are male-dominated, uh, male-identified, male-centered. So another way to think of this is uh, how is the society aligned? If it's matrilineal, then the families get their descent from their mother's side. If the society is patrilineal, then they receive their last name through the father's side. Um, and a true patrilineal society is one in which the females would receive no inheritance. Uh, they are simply under the responsibility of their father and when they get married they are moved to the responsibility of their husband. America is uh, a bilineal society where we we trace our ancestry from our fathers and our mothers um, and there is a, uh, a fair amount of patriarchy uh, in terms of our heritage and our history. Um, Obviously, we, we move to egalitarianism, 
uh, was a strong movement towards egalitarianism today. The term sexism is a, a legal issue. It is defined as unjust discrimination based on a person's sex. So it is against the law for someone to be hired or fired solely on the basis of their sex. Belief that one sex is innately superior to the other is racism. Uh, sexual harassment is abuse of one's position of authority to force unwanted sexual attention on another person. Now there's different types of sexual harassment as we will look at, but even a hostile environment, uh, making inappropriate uh, sexual jokes uh, around f folks who are not comfortable with that would and could be classified as, um, and actually is defined as sexual harassment. So sociologists are interested in explaining differences uh, in gender. The sociobiological view suggests that our social behavior and our gender behavior result from biological differences. So one example would be uh, hormone levels. Uh, testosterone is the, uh, the male androgen. It floods the male brain with uh, diminishing connections in the communication centers. So this would explain the fact that males typically use report talk instead of rapport talk. So estrogen enhances the communication centers uh, and so females oftentimes will use rapport, R-A-P-P-O-R-T, um, rapport language where we're building relationships, etc. Um, now there's some other things. So researchers found elevated levels of testosterone in infant girls and found out they grow up to be tomboys and enjoy playing sports. Uh, so these things uh, are true scientific facts. Sociobiologists would point them out. The social learning theory uh, grew up uh, as a response or I guess in connection with behaviorism sort of the cognitive behavioral view, so it's uh, associated with psychology, but as it's manifested in sociology, the argument here is that learning takes place by reinforcement, uh, so rewards and punishment. The learning model says that you know kids learn gender by imitating mom and dad, and then they are rewarded. You know, parents even buy into this, they buy, little shaving kits for their boys, a uh, little soap, foam soap that looks like shaving cream. And, uh, I actually, we used to have this uh, for my kids. Uh, that's kind of a fun thing. But the social learning theorists would look at it as a way in which kids are reinforced for gendered behavior. The cognitive developmental theory says that children process their world in very concrete means. As they get older, they can look at life more abstractly. Uh, the cognitive developmental theory says this is the result of biology uh, and increasing social experience. So for example, a two-year-old child would see sex as uh, based on outside changeable attributes such as hair and clothing. Girls wear dresses, boys wear pants. Uh, the five-year-old identity is based on what you want to do, uh, what you like to do, playing with toys, or playing with trucks, or uh, playing with dolls. The gender schema theory says that children develop a framework of knowledge with mental categories for organizing our perceptions or cultural expectations. Uh, and as a kid gets older, their gender schema uh, can become more abstract. So once the gender schema is established, it becomes more rigid during adolescence 
and oftentimes develops into gender stereotypes. Sociobiologists argue that in addition to biology, there are social factors that influence our gender beliefs. Um, they would even go so far as to say the environment will make manifest our biology. They would look at specific areas of, of biology that are influenced uh, by several factors. So uh, we'll look at parents, peers, education, workplace, and the mass media. So research indicates that dads treat their children differently than mothers. Uh, they typically have more hands-on play, uh, more tickling, wrestling, joking, uh, but they may not be as capable of having uh, emotional conversations or being available to a child's uh, vulnerabilities. The parental influence also speaks to different physical and verbal manipulations. So dads and moms interact differently uh, in terms of their physical communication as well. This research also directs attention towards uh, stereotypical gender identified objects. So moms and dads will uh, treat children differently um, in terms of gender. Sometimes there are different verbal descriptions for the same behavior. So when you see girls, for instance, running around and uh, acting boisterously, uh, they, they would more likely be rep uh, reprimanded as to acting outside of how girls are supposed to act. Um, and this seems to be effective. By the time they get to school, girls are um, not disciplined as much for jumping around. Usually boys are... Uh, seen as disobedient when they are um, jumping around and, uh, and acting boisterously. The peer influence is also extremely important to kids. Peers are those equal to you in status. Uh, girls often take their cues from boys. Boys may promote gender stereotyping uh, in their play. Sociological research has indicated that boys are treated differently than girls. Uh, boys tend to get reprimanded for boisterous play. Uh, messiness may be explained away uh, and it actually hurts their grades. So if you have a boy and a girl who have an identical response, uh, girls will oftentimes be praised and get rewarded. So uh, one researcher found that certain things tr uh, signal to teachers uh, which child uh, gets the better grade. So, so teachers are almost grading cleanliness and punctuality and appearance um, more so than the content. Gender also finds uh, environmental or work influence. There have been occupations dominated by females and certain occupations dominated by males. Half of working women are found in administrative support and service support. Um, most U.S. Senators, Congressional representatives are men. Um, what's interesting is uh, in engineering, it's historically been a male-dominated profession. Um, we see more women entering than ever before. Uh, the, the fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM fields, uh, predominantly male historically, but we're also seeing um, an increase of females in those fields. Uh, if you take my field, psychology, there's actually more women uh, in the field of psychology than ever before. It used to be a male-dominated field. Now it is a female 
uh, largely female-dominated field. Uh, if you go into higher education, there are more women with PhDs than men, uh, but there are more males in dean and college uh, presidency positions. So the traditional gender identities have advantages. Uh, there's also some downsides, but historically males have had a higher income. Uh, they have had other job-related advantages, uh, namely their identity. Usually a male's occupational identity is his identity. Uh, this traditional gender identity has also provided a sense of bond. It is the connection that men have with other men. Right? Guys talk about work with one another. It's uh, in a different way than girls might talk, or females would talk about work. Um, for females, you might say this is a big part of their identity. Um, but you see a great deal of depression and even um, uh, just sort of uh, identity crises for men when they lose their jobs. Um, females, on the other hand, if they lose their job, they probably are better at communicating this and probably have more friends uh, with whom to connect with. So, to females, their identity tends to uh, center um, in more areas than just their work. Uh, they historically have had a closer attachment with children than men. So, as I've mentioned, for males, when losing their job, this can be a great sense of identity crisis. Uh, their personal self-worth can be tied to a position, and not just income. Uh, and it can be a double-edged sword. When they have a, a job that fulfills their identity, it may actually pull them away from their family. Uh, they may have job-related stress, less time with the family, um, and they may not be equipped uh, to emotionally express themselves. Uh, in the cases of divorce, males oftentimes do not get full custody. Um, and may actually um, be limited uh, in their child custody arrangements. Uh, specifically, what I've seen in dealing with this uh, my entire life is that females um, typically are better at communicating and getting through uh, a crisis of this nature. As I've said earlier in the class, uh, my wife and I have adopted. Uh, we have had the opportunity to counsel women from many different walks of life, uh, many of whom are dealing with infertility, can't get pregnant. Uh, and we have seen, just as a male might get depressed if he loses his job, we've worked with women who get depressed when they can't have babies. Uh, so in many cases, we see women, their gender identity is wrapped up in, uh, in having children. Uh, that can be a problem. Uh, this is just one of many drawbacks. Um, a spouse, uh, a female may have self-worth issues. And uh, the beauty problem, right? Women are, in our society, feel as though they're being compared to uh, an imaginary ideal and they may not feel as though they measure up.